Hi, welcome to the Women Who Code podcast. I'm Shannon Stewart, a principal research scientist at Altana AI, and today I'm going to tell you about my unique path in data science. Before I get started, I just wanted to say how honored I am to be speaking on this podcast. I've been listening along and I am I am so thrilled to be in the company of such amazing women who are leading with such heart. I'm going to tell you about my path in data science. The version I'm telling you today is the completely unvarnished version. It has detours and setbacks. And I wanted to tell you about those today because I think we don't always talk about those aspects of our career and And you often get the most optimistic, polished version of a career journey. So to start at the beginning, my education was in molecular biology, and my PhD was in the chemical senses. And you might be thinking, you must have made a really big pivot to get into data science, but I don't see it that way. The data that I worked with as a PhD student was multifaceted. It was chaotic because some of it was animal behavior data. And this shares some really important features in common with the kinds of data that are generated by humans and human institutions. And so the techniques that I learned to analyze that kind of data are things I still use in my career today. I also use the, the, the path of thinking that I learned as a scientist to design good experiments that get us to the root cause of what we observe in data. My first detour happened right away. I did not have a job lined up after my PhD. And instead, I got an opportunity to go to Taiwan and I took it. While I was there, I took intensive language classes. While I was in Taiwan, I took intensive language classes, and this was really pivotal and important to the rest of my journey. And it introduced me to a new kind of flexibility of thinking and empowered me with a lot of new skills that I just hadn't had before. Not just language skills, but resiliency. It was also a pretty radical step in general, and forced me to get along way outside my comfort zone and just trust that I could muddle through discomfort. So I had gone from the top of my field, finishing a PhD, to being (laughs) completely illiterate. (laughs) And it was a huge challenge, but I still use the skills that I use to get by there in my work today. My first professional job then was at MIT's Center for Biomedical Innovation. I was working on a project whose aim was to identify the leading indicators that a food or medicine had been adulterated on purpose so that the FDA could stop those shipments from getting into the country. Here's where I started learning about modeling supply chains and using AI techniques. Our team was highly interdisciplinary. We had members from MIT's Sloan School of Business and from CSAIL, the Computer Science and AI Laboratory. I really got to learn from every member of the team, even students. And one thing that I really picked up from them was how to start a coding project on a completely new problem where no solution path exists. I also learned a ton about natural language processing, or NLP. Another key piece of knowledge that I picked up there was how to tie observations or features in the data back to their actual root causes, which is an important skill in data science. You have to do this to avoid, for instance, picking multiple features that are all correlated to the same cause. And also, because you want your models to be robust 
and reflective of the actual thing you're trying to measure or predict. So for instance, we find suppliers who are not flying right and have very different graph embeddings than other players in their industry. Why is that? Well, in some cases, it's because they're poisoning their business relationships because they're obviously trying to cheat their counterparties by adulterating and also by doing other things. MIT is also <laughs> synonymous with startups and innovation. So I was able to take a class at the Sloan School of Business on doing a startup. And it was actually way more accessible than I thought. I really left that class with the idea that I wanted to try it out for myself. The other thing that I started thinking about at this point was innovation, not just a buzzword, but how to identify these situations where big systems are, are sort of in conflict with each other and are going to create an opportunity that has not existed before. Or conversely, how to intentionally break a system that has existed for a long time, but maybe it shouldn't, or it's just not working right. One thing that came up toward the end of my time at MIT was when I had traced back why we were seeing so many shipments rejected for a certain food product. And once I traced it, the supply chain all the way back and learned more about the supplier, there were local news reports in the native language of its context that showed that they had workers living in iron cages on the premises. It was a huge local scandal. It opened my eyes to the fact that literal slavery is still happening in the world today. To this day, this was one of the most egregious examples of this I have ever seen. And since then, I have worked years on forced labor. But meanwhile, I had thought I had my next job in the bag. But about a week before I started, it fell through catastrophically. So when my husband got a job at a Dutch university, I left and moved to Holland. I felt completely defeated. It was an awful experience and it really undermined my confidence. When I tell the polished version of this story, I don't mention this, but these setbacks are a key formative piece of the, the story as a whole. So let's set that aside. We're going to come back to it. Once I was established in Holland, a professor reached out to me who had come into possession of some business data that showed that North Korea was sending workers to Europe, but the state was keeping most of those workers' wages. And this practice was financing their nuclear weapons program and buying luxury goods for their top elites. This practice happens in a shocking number of countries around the world. North Korean workers are building battleships, working in garment factories, doing all sorts of skilled and unskilled work, and they're not receiving their wages. They're under a very strict system of control. I think this puts some of my own career problems in perspective. So I took that data and structured it into a graph database based on the way that the ICIJ did it for the offshore leaks database. If you're not familiar, that's where the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers are accessible. In order to do this, I had to teach myself cipher query language, which I do not recommend. If you find that you need to build a graph database, try to find a class. <laughs> The documentation was very bad. But the theme here is I will overcome anything to teach myself to do anything if I think the goal is worthy. Based on this track record, I next got hired at the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery. It was like a startup. I was the 14th employee. There were opportunities there 
to kind of define your own role in the organization and try things out. I think the most important parts for me though, were clarifying my big vision and personal mission, which is to end modern slavery by making it unprofitable, by smashing the business model. And that's where I started to see a path. So now I had integrated what I had learned at MIT about innovation and what I had learned from my own practice about the way that forced labor exists in the world. My keystone project at GFEMS was developing a machine learning classifier that takes in information about a company's operations, which includes things like its location, financial health, trade patterns, ownership structure, and it estimates based on its similarities or differences with firms that are known to use forced labor, whether an unknown, unaudited firm has a potential risk and needs to be audited. Now, I'm a research scientist at Altana AI, where all of these pieces are coming into place. Altana was founded to pioneer a shared source of truth and empower governments, logistics providers, and businesses to build trusted, sustainable, and ethical supply chain networks. Every experience I've had up to this point leads me to believe that this is actually possible and that our approach is an, is an important first step. That I was able to get repeatable signal out of the same data for adulterated and counterfeit pharmaceuticals, as well as forced labor, shows me that the math works. At Altana, our knowledge graph includes over 400 million companies and billions of transactions. So we're talking really, really big data. This job has been a great learning experience for me because for the first time, I'm working with really experienced software engineers and I'm learning so much from them. But we also work together as a team using our unique strengths. So I sometimes come up with a little proof of concept that I think is going to work for us. And I work with our engineers to scale it to the size of our whole graph in a way that does not take 200 years to compute. <laughs> day to day, I mainly work on our core backend technology, continuously constructing the knowledge, knowledge graph. Within the team that does that, I lead the overlay of data sets that include things like lists of sanctioned companies or conversely, lists of companies with important certifications. This type of task is one of the core functions of data science. Reconciling a list on one hand with a list on the other hand where the entities and records may or may not match across those lists. I also sometimes get to work directly with clients, helping them understand where their value chains intersect with risks like forced labor so that they, th they can make informed decisions about whether remediation is possible or they need to redirect their sourcing. I also take on special projects that help our product work better, making the graph connect as it should by enriching it if needed. Sometimes this uses skills that I learned deep in my past, like Chinese language NLP. It is so rare to have a path that has no setbacks and diversions and no amount of planning and preparation is going to help you avoid them. Everybody has them, but they don't talk about them as much in retrospect. In my case, the year I spent in Taiwan, I didn't really know it was going to lead to anything productive for me, but I had always wanted to live overseas and I regretted not participating in something like study abroad. So when I got that chance, I just took it. Just following my own path and being authentic opened up something to me that hadn't been possible before 
but I didn't have any particular goal in mind when I did it because I just could not have imagined what was in the future for me. That's what I think my unique path taught me. Trusting yourself and being true to yourself is going to bring the goal into focus. Being pragmatic and planning, it just doesn't necessarily produce better or more predictable success. And you'll have setbacks. They might be big ones, but they're also an opportunity to refocus on what's important to you and to become your authentic self, someone you might not meet without those challenges. Thanks for listening. You can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Blue Sky. I hope we meet again soon.